Hi, good morning, everyone. As the soundtrack fades, <laughs> good morning. I was like checking to make sure it's still morning. Um, it absolutely is. Um, welcome to this installment of Building Berkeley, Building Belonging at Berkeley and Beyond Before, a dialogue series hosted by the Division of Equity and Inclusion. Our topic um, for the conversation today is safety. Thank you for joining us. My name is Elisa Diana Huerta. My pronouns are they, them, aye. Um, and I'm one of the co-conveners for Before, along with Mariana Matthews and Atman Pimentel Mendoza. I'd like to offer our land acknowledgement now that we have uh, those kind of technical parts covered. Um, UC Berkeley sits on the territory of Huchun, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chachonu speaking Ohlone people, the successors of the sovereign Verona band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Muakma Ohlone tribe and other familial descendants of the Verona band. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. Consistent with our values of community, inclusion, and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to Native peoples. As members of the Berkeley community, it is vitally important that we not only recognize the history of the land on which we stand, but also we recognize that the Mwakma Ohlone people are alive and flourishing members of the Berkeley and broader Bay Area communities today. Again, thank you all so much for joining us and I'm gonna pass the mic over to Atman. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. My name is Atman Pimentel Mendoza. I use she and he pronouns. I'm one of the people on the planning committee for B4. I'm really excited to be here with you all as part of this conversation on safety. Thank you, Elisa, for introducing us and for grounding us today. I wanna to share a little bit about the background of B4 as well as the flow for today's conversation. So the theoretical grounding of this B4 series is Paulo Freire's work and concept on critical consciousness, which embodies a mindset of reading the world and uh, reading the word and the world, my apologies. We center this work in advancing belonging and justice as defined by our Othering and Belonging Institute. Belonging or being fully human means more than just being seen or having access. Belonging entails having meaningful input and the opportunity to participate in the design of social and cultural structures. It means being respected at a basic level that includes the right to co-create and make demands upon society. So the intention of this B4 series is to be a space where topics and speakers spark critical consciousness into vision and practice, embodying that sense of belonging and justice for our collective liberation. Again, today's topic is safety. We're really excited to have this conversation with the folks who are going to be on here and especially excited that Kyoko Thomas will be moderating for us. Uh, the flow of today, we're, I'm going to head it off to Kyoko in a moment. Um, she's going to introduce our speakers and then have some moderated prepared questions for them to answer. If questions come up for you, again, please put them into the Padlet. We'll lift them up for Kyoko to see and hopefully we'll uh, get to your question and we'll get to the Q&A. Um, so once again, I'm going to hand it off to Kyoko Thomas now. Kyoko Thomas is the director of the Basic Needs Center and our moderator for today's conversation. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you so much, Antman. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Antman mentioned, I'm Kyoko Thomas, she, they pronouns, and I am the director of our Basic Needs Center. Very much excited and honored to be facilitating this really important conversation today as we think about the role that safety plays on our campus's journey um, in building both a community and culture belonging and thriving. Um, I will have our incredible panelists introduce themselves, including their names, roles, as well as how and from where they sit in today's conversation. So I'll have Cece Ambrosio start us off. Hi, everyone. I'm Cece Ambrosio. Um, I work at the Gender Equity Resource Center. I'm the director of Women's Resources and have been doing uh, work around sexual violence, sexual harassment resource sharing. Um, over my time here. I use she, they, and Sha pronouns, Sha being the Tagalog all gender pronoun. Um, as a, I come to this conversation as a cis woman, straight, middle class, who grew up partly in the Philippines, which means that I have a little bit of like residual Catholic guilt stuff happening, internalized sexism, and lots of um, experiences around being protected by my uh, family members and being told what I should be doing and um, how I should be experiencing the world. 
Um, I'm also coming to this um, conversation as a long time Berkeley person. So being a student, um, I'm a current grad student at Davis and a long time staff member who is honestly worn out. <laughs> I'm a person of a smaller frame and I'm also a self-defense instructor. And I'm also coming in with a little bit of brain fog because um, I got COVID. And so sometimes I might kind of freeze. So that's me and I'll pass it back to Kyoko. Thank you so much, Cece. That was maybe the most brilliant introduction I've heard. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that and really appreciate um, just hearing a little bit about what where you're at today. I'll invite Tobias to introduce himself as well. Good morning, everybody. It's a, a joy and a pleasure to be here with you all. Um, my name is Tobias Moselle Newby, and um, I use he and they pronouns. I am the director of social services over here at the Tang Center, and I've been on campus for 12 years. And so how am I arriving today? Well, you know, I was home in North Carolina recently, so I am arriving just drenched in Southern goodness, uh, greasy fried food <laughs> uh, and, and sunny hearts celebrating my granddad's 90th birthday. Um, so I carry my elders, my ancestors with me in this moment. Um, related to this conversation, particularly I've been in the field of, of supporting survivors and particularly working with folks who have caused harm for 20 years. Uh, that was my four way into work around trauma and violence is understanding what leads people to be violent and how they might change those behaviors. Um, I do that in a black body, a queer body, a polyamorous body. Um, and as a healer in this world, I identify as a healer before a therapist because I think healing is not held by any one modality. Um, come to this conversation as an activist in decolonial frameworks and concepts of justice. And um, I've been on this campus for 12 years remain here because I continue to see opportunities and avenues for change and growth and transformation. And so as long as I can see that, I'll keep on doing this. So, so glad to be here with you all. Thank you. Thank you, Tobias. That was beautiful. And last, but certainly not least, I'm passing the mic to Lucy Andrews to introduce herself. Thanks. Hi, folks. Wow, to see 92 people signed on to Zoom to engage this question of safety um, from the position or the thinking around critical consciousness is such a beautiful gift. Um, my name is Lucy, she, her. Uh, I'm a graduate student, and I like to also say that I'm a graduate student worker. The labor part of my life really matters and how I relate to this place that is UC Berkeley. Um, for those for whom this may be helpful, I'm a white woman sitting here in a jean jacket in front of a whiteboard with a few math equations on it, for which I can take no credit. They were already here. Um, and I come into this conversation as somebody who has, through a couple decades of life, developed um, a commitment to abolition in the fullest and most loving version of what that might be. Um, I have learned a lot from the traditions and the organizing that has built that way of being and thinking and relating. Many of them are Black feminist legacies. Um, many of them come from the work of people experimenting with collective care, with mutuality, with um, love instead of punishment. And my particular inroads to that um, have been through the work of disabled and neurodivergent folks who are fighting carceral forms of health care, um, through harm reduction communities, folks that are um, building um, deep love and acceptance for the many ways that we all might relate to the world and consciousness. Um, and I come into this as the survivor of many forms of violence um, that have been um, transformative for me. And I don't mean to suggest that I'm grateful, but rather that um, my life is different because of them. And that's built in me um, through communities of healing, uh, a Buddhist practice and a Buddhist commitment to nonviolence and to non-harming that informs all that I do and how I am. Um, and in particular, I want to pay, um, respect and homage to a group of folks that I am a part of that are thinking about, um, healing across, uh, different relationships and positions to harm. We're survivors of harm, particularly sort of as conceived of as crime, 
and folks who've perpetuated harm, conceived of as crime, and who have been incarcerated for it and are now free, are trying to understand what it means to heal together across those experiences. Um, and that has been a space and a community that has taught me that deep healing and transformation are possible. Um, and I now hold that core in my body to be true. So that's me. Thank you so much, Lucy. Um, for all of us, you know, in this conversation today, I think we're absolutely honored to have all of your wisdom that you bring to the table. And again, really want to appreciate the full authenticity of being human together in this conversation. So as we move to our first question to really start this conversation today, um, you know, with the conversations of Paulo Freire's critical consciousness, what terms, inspirations, and systems are vital for you to name to engage in this dialogue on practicing and building belonging? And Tobias, I would love you to kick us off with this first question. Thank you so much. Um... One of the first things that came to mind when I read this question uh, is our ancestor, Auntie Bell Hooks, and her assessment of our society as an imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy. And I remember when I first read that terminology, there was something that aligned so deeply in me and spoke to my experience as a, a Black person from the South, a Black queer person from the South. And so that's one way, one thing that comes to mind when I think about critical consciousness. Also, the second thing is love. Um, I really come from a family where love is the primary value. It is how we do our work. It is how we try to speak to each other. It is how we try to live. And when we're holding concepts around safety, um, that just comes up for me. You know, if I'm in an environment where I feel loved and feel seen and feel able to express love to others, then I'm on a pathway that makes safety more possible. Other thing I will say is, you know, just holding in mind ancestors and wise elders, um, some of these wise elders on this campus, um, some I see names on the on the panelists that have been teachers for me over my 12 years on campus. And then the last thing I will say is just frameworks around um, the impact of colonization across this world and how we can continue to learn from the many decolonial efforts of communities that teach us how um, to reclaim, how to resist, and how to rise up, and how to rejoice in that. So I'll stop there. Lucy, I'd love to have you share with this, um, you know, your answers to this question. Thank you. I feel like I might have gotten into it and been out of order on the questions already, uh, but we'll see what comes up with a second pass. Um, I prepared some notes and also uh, may end up deviating from them as as my colleagues here offer their thoughts and new thoughts arise in me. Um, so when I think about the legacies or the inheritances um, that I'm bringing into the room, I appreciate Cece mentioning a little bit about Catholicism. I've got one side of the family that is uh, quite Catholic and with that um, has certainly come a little bit of guilt, but also a really deep commitment to embodied service that a person shows up in a way that is physical um, when harm and suffering are present. Um, that continues to inform me, even though, you know, I certainly wouldn't consider myself Catholic uh, and don't necessarily have a concept of God that aligns there. Um, I want to, you know, when I think about safety for myself, also speak a little bit to the earth um, and to Oakland in particular. Um, I am a constant, forever lifelong student of Oakland. The town is brilliant, and I am so fortunate to live there and will stay as long as Oakland will have me um, because there is such creativity and commitment um, in the organizing fabric of Oakland about different ways to be in the world that don't depend on putting people in cages and that don't depend on punishment and banishment um, and that believe that everyone is forever redeemable and everyone can heal and offer healing. Um, I work with a lot of teenagers and they constantly uh, force me to have a sense of humor and make sure I'm being in the world in the way that I profess to want to be. Um, so, you know, big shout out to students at Oakland Tech who are actually perhaps more of my teachers than anybody here at Cal. Um, and I also come into this having appreciated um, deep solidarity with my peers in graduate school over the five years now that I've been here. Um, the strike this past fall from the position of being a graduate worker was all sorts of incredible and exhausting and tense all at once. Um, and I was lucky to work with a group of folks who bring 
you know, in a scholarly sense, what, be, what might be considered a critical or abolitionist university lens to our time here, and that are aiming to reckon with the ways that the university accumulates and exploits and gentrifies, and wondering what it might look like for a place like this to be different, and what's even possible within the confines of the institution that we have right now. So those are legacies that shape my thinking and my being. Um, and I'm sure there are more, but those are the ones that come to mind. Let's see. Lucy, would you, I want to pass the mic to you to share also what inspires you and shapes you in this conversation. Yeah, when I first got these questions, I tried to jump down the things and came to mind and now I'm like, oh, I want to add some of the other things that everyone else is saying. Um, but part of it is just me knowing that I'm a member of a community of the, you know, this Berkeley community, as I mentioned, as a longtime member, starting as a mm -hmm. younger student to now like mm -hmm. a longtime staff member. And that I have, mm -hmm. a, um, I'm coming to it with knowing that I have a certain role working at the Gender Equity Resource Center um, and while it's not only me who has a responsibility, let's say for safety, I know that I can contribute towards safety of myself um, and also maybe safety of others in my circle, whether that's sharing information or sharing skills and that kind of thing. I'm also coming to this conversation kind of thinking about agency and bodily autonomy. Um, so growing up, I was always told what to do and didn't really know how to make decisions for myself. And part of that was, is also acknowledging what my needs were. So I didn't have the practice of thinking about my needs. And so how would I, I mean, it's kind of like, if I don't think about my needs and um, don't have practice in that, how am I going to sort of take my own actions towards that? Um, I also recognize in my role of working in a resource center that it's also meeting sort of people where they're at when we're talking about conversations and engaging in dialogue um, because folks won't have the same experiences that I have or the same entry into it, but hoping that there uh, will be, uh, what's the word, like um, an openness to engaging in conversations. Um, and the last three things that I want to share is that, um, you know, doing the work around um, self-defense and being an instructor, there's a piece around the concept around like that, that I am worth it, you know, like that I am deserving of my safety and that, um, I mean, it seems like such a basic kind of um, concept, right? Like it's so critical to just existence really um, that that and I'm not trying to be like a commercial for like Loria like you know because you're worth it kind of thing but there is like a a, 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 a simplicity to it around my own self-worth and um, and ways that I can um, whether it's defining boundaries, um or expressing needs and um lastly about you know you know this kind of like honesty with self and honesty with others is tied in with that and then also one thing that i've been sort of mulling over um several years is this kind of concept around like emotional safety um and emotional self-defense and um, I'm not, I don't quite have it quite yet, but um, there is this piece where I've experienced the whole like, you need to have a tough skin and you know, those kinds of, of, uh, of um, advice, I don't know, um, sometimes, you know, unsolicited. 
But there is something in that that is really interesting to me around what does that mean to, to um, like protect yourself, but then also to, um, to feel that you're worth it. So I'll end there. I think you all shared how really these influences have really shaped the fabric of your beings and influences different components of both your personal and professional lives. And as we move the conversation from um, really this context um, of building belonging, and as we move towards thinking about thriving, I would love if you all could share about what in your work or your personal lives, um, what does it mean to actually thrive? We talk about that a lot on our campus, um, also in our division. Um, and it's helpful to think about, you know, how we really manifest that and what that looks like for each one of you. So um, I would love to pass the mic to Lucy to start us off. Sure thing. Um, the question being, what does it mean to thrive in relationship to safety uh, rather than simply survive or get by? Um, I think one of the reasons that I was invited to this conversation uh, is that I have sort of a formal role on campus, which is co-chairing a chancellor's committee that thinks about and recommends and collects community brilliance about policing and community safety. Um, and to sort of name my principles, I understand safety to come from community and not to come from infrastructures of policing and surveillance. Um, and I think that is because my ideas about safety are, um, are bodily, recognizing often that body and mind and spirit are not separate, and that surveillance and the threat of violence that can come from state infrastructures of control are directly in opposition to that idea of bodily safety and then ultimately connected emotional, mental, spiritual safety. Um, when I think about thriving, I think about everyone having a body and a nervous system and a somatic experience where deep rest and calm are accessible. Um, and that comes from having material security, a home, enough income for not only basic needs, but also pleasure. Um, I think about uh, freedom from all forms of harm, not only harms that are often in the cultural media zeitgeist, things like uh, violent crime, things like property theft, but also the forms of harm that aren't necessarily criminalized, or if they are not necessarily um, pursued for accountability and repair. I think about things like pollution as a source of lack of safety. I think about um, extraction and exploitation that continues to widen our economic and income gulfs even wider. Um, to speak sort of in the language that uh, Ruthie Wilson Gilmore has offered to many of us. Safety um, is often challenged in the United States by the ways in which our racial and colonial and class histories expose people to premature death. That ultimately racial capitalism creates conditions of premature death for poor folks, for black and brown folks, for low income folks, for people who are not cis or straight. Um, and that that is one of our fundamental challenges when it comes to safety. I also say this with a great degree of humility as a survivor of violence, and some of that violence is classified as violent crime, and always do want to center the agency of survivors in that work. Um, the group of folks with whom I commune and organize who are survivors of violence don't see that um, punishment and carcerality and ultimately human caging is the answer, is healing, is preventative, is safety, um, but also know that not everybody agrees around that, and that I think that that is a conversation whose complexity we can entertain. So thriving for me, for me personally is bodily. I hope that that extends to many folks and would be excited to hear from my colleagues on this panel as to how they interpret that question. Yeah, the deep rest, right, and the ability to actually go there, that really resonates. I think I saw a lot of head nods, right, in terms of that being so fundamental. And I think naming that is so, so important. Um, Cece, if you also want to, um, you know, be able to answer for you, right, this bridge of what thriving looks like in the relationship and context of safety. I, I had a sort of like a visual 
it's like visual of the MCC logo, <laughs> which is like a growing, like a, a growing plant. I mean, having like a rooted foundation, like I think is um, important. Um, and then this idea of like sustenance. So that could mean a bunch of different things from like some of the things that Lucy has shared already. And then I had this piece about like, you know, how in the spring and then like the leaves are kind of stretching out and having that kind of like, you could see the, the leaves, the little like little bitty like leaves start off as this kind of like this idea of like stretch dreams, um, like and um, experimentation, uh, trying things, exploring. Um, so that's kind of what came up for me was this visual. I wish I had my MCC like shirt right now my, and I'll just like show it to you all but I, I might go get it later but yeah. I love the offering of a visual interpretation CC I think it gives us a sense of how your brain right conceptualizes these concepts in a way that I think is directly uh, relevant you know as we move into thinking about um, kind of our individual personal and professional lives, as we know, they're deeply interconnected and interwoven into our larger community. I want us to think about what role does safety play as the university commits to fostering a campus community of belonging and thriving? And Tobiris, um, if you can share a little bit about um, your answer to this question. Yeah, so I, I'm reading this question starting from the into the beginning to kind of help ground me um, because holding the concepts of safety, belonging and thriving. Um, I really love um, earlier, Lucy, that you just called in the earth and then Cece talking about the leaves stretching out and plants are such great teachers for me um, and such a great reflection of where I am in a particular moment. Um, and so when I think about what it means to thrive and what it means to belong, um, for me, it feels difficult, if not impossible, to really walk in a sense of safety in an environment where you don't feel like you belong there, in an environment where you feel that your access to the resources, to the understanding, to the community support that you need to be your best self is limited or is, is sutured. And so I think it is so important when we're thinking about safety on this campus to really it's in my mind is so much about scale and scope. I mean, we're a huge, huge campus. And so when we try to throw a blanket of this is what safety looks like here, we're going to be on the wrong footing immediately because we have to break it down to what does that mean for various communities and what concepts of safety for folks who have more power, more access, more positionality mean versus those who are feeling more disenfranchised and marginalized and, and sidelined. And so for me, that's part of the conversation is we have to wrestle with this dialectic of, for some folks, there is a, you know, they kind of start with the external view of safety, and that can lead us to thinking more about property safety, um, more about space safety. And then for some folks, we start, we start inside and, you know, it's just coming up for me just to invite everybody to take a really deep belly breath just down to your core. Because for me, in moments where I don't feel safe, that is one of the first things I go to, is to try to get centered into what is my gut brain trying to tell me about this scenario? When I breathe, when I can center, when I can root, what do I see, what do I perceive around me that is not safe? What are some of the things that I am told, even on this campus, are for my safety, but given the body and the experience that I have, immediately make me feel afraid? And I have stories of that over my years here, of even walking to try to support students, walking through um, barricades of police and saying, well, I, I'm trying to, to walk to this place to offer support, but my own body doesn't feel safe in this context where safety mechanisms have been put up. And so I think, you know, really being able to, to wrestle with these things, and you alluded to this earlier, Lucy, that, you know, where some people feel their, their footing and safety is, is in deep, deep, stark contrast with the historical, generational, and lived experience of others. And so if we're able to sit and breathe at that intersection where we begin to diverge, there's so much wisdom there. 
if we can sit at the place where somebody might be pulled to say, yes, we need more police and somebody might be pulled to say we need none, if we can sit right at that intersection before we solidify our thoughts down those paths, there's so much to learn from each other. And so for me at this university to continue to foster a place where we can thrive and where we can belong, we have to be able to sit at that divergence point and understand what is driving you that way when I am so committed to going that way. What don't I know about your life history? What do I know? don't I know about the history of the, the people you come from? What don't I know about the way I just walked up to you and looked at you, <laughs> you know? What, what do I need to investigate about my own projections and assumptions? And if we can sit at that place, you know, then I think we really can get ourselves on a road to something that, that resembles safety. Always realizing that at the, end of the, at the end of the day, if nine of us feel safe and one does not, then this is not a safe environment. And what I think you're speaking to, to virus that really has been named at various points by all the panelists today is really being able to have these conversations around safety, having the space, and even being able to collectively define what safety means for all of us is really important, which is why this conversation is very timely. Lucy, I invite you to answer this question as well. Thank you. What role does safety play as the university commits to fostering a campus community of belonging and thriving? Um, I don't know that I'd prepare for this one, so we're going to see what comes out off the cuff. Um, I hear a lot of rhetoric around UC Berkeley not having many financial resources, and I hold that and understand it to be both true and false at the same time. Um, I think that this is a university that when compared to its peers or those that it deems its peers, perhaps doesn't have the, what I will call like gross and egregious endowments. But I still think that it is an entity that has incredible financial resources, particularly com compared to a lot of the folks and institutions trying to work in our backyard here in the broader East Bay. And so I wonder what it looks like for commitments to safety to be deeply material. No one I think can be safe when experiencing housing and food insecurity. And so many of us do. And this is an institution that has a lot of money. And so how do we bring that money to the task of material safety feels really important. And I will not profess to be an expert. And I understand that there are always so many more claims on that money than I have even any idea about. So I have some humility around that, but continue to wonder what's possible, which is in part why um, I found such joy on the picket line this fall. I think there were so many of us asking this question of um, what could the university be um, as a place that supports people's basic needs as a precondition of their educational, their research, their professional success. Um, I also think that this is a place where we can experiment if folks are willing to try. Um, Berkeley has a legacy of experimentation and um, I want to highlight certainly the role that students and faculty play in that, but also staff. This is a campus that has incredible staff who have been doing deep and hard work for a long time and are often unrecognized. And I've seen so much beautiful experimentation that staff have brought to the table to try to create conditions of belonging and safety and, and dare I say, even thriving. Um, I also think... Um, that Berkeley is a place that continues to try to hold complexity to bring that thread to the fore that my co-panelists have offered time and time again. Um, and that has felt hard to entertain over the past couple of years because of the pandemic in the sense that, you know, I can at least speak for myself. I have felt under bodily threat, which has reduced my ability to engage nuance. Um, but I know that that is a legacy of this institution and, and think that that's something that we can all commit to engaging um, such that when we think about resourcing our work, to create safety and engaging the contradictions and holding space for what may be friction-laden conversations based in a variety of ideologies. Um, we may be able to do that here. So that's what I think the institution could possibly bring. Thank you, Lucy. Um, as you identified how staff play such an important role, um, I know in particular, Gen Ack has been really influential and important and really 
building, I think, a sense of safety and belonging. And so, Cece, I would love if you wouldn't mind also sharing your perspective as being um, one of the wise members of our community in terms of that perspective. Uh, yes, I will. Uh, <laughs> I, there's a couple of things swirling in my head right now. Um, I am really thinking about this idea that has been shared earlier already around scale, like the scale, the scale of our campus and that kind of thing. And this might sound controversial, but I'm just gonna say it anyway. Um, like this, even the idea of like, okay, we have resources and we want to scale it up. I think it's very, it's tempting, but I think it's that kind of concept of wanting to like have that can be, um, it's like a, it's an exercise in making assumptions about what everyone needs. When in reality, we're talking about different communities and different needs um, and what's been shared by my colleagues already. And so that kind of came to me when I was listening around, um, you know, we're trying to be good with our resources and um, how can we like get <laughs> bang for our buck kind of idea and, and do that kind of thing. And not to say that we don't wanna learn uh, from, you know, others and ideas that have worked, but I think it can be tempting because of the um, because of the assumptions that comes along with it. And um, so I just say that. And then I think for me, when I was reading this question, I was also thinking about um, like how safety is just a, such a basic concept like I shared already. And, um, but I think in terms of the campus, I think there could be more investment and I don't, I, I mean, investment could, be, could mean monetary things um resources but investment in sort of continued conversation um you know we have this you know before but how you know like how do we continue this conversation that kind of thing and it could be just like opportunities big and small you know it could be big things like this where we're trying to like engage like the campus um broadly and it could be just the conversation that you're having with your colleague or your classmate or um, really just how are we communicating and building safety together right because if we're making assumptions right and that my safety needs are the same as yours they might be but i don't necessarily know right if i um I'm not asking the question. So I think there's an investment in continued conversations, big and small. And I think there's a lot of um, uh, maybe breaking the silence. And there is the piece around when we talk about sexual violence and sexual harassment, a lot of you know shame and um, uh, silence around that. So I think that there's also um, that those kinds of programs and that kind of thing that could be um, could be useful. Um, and not to say that they don't exist now. I mean, Take Back the Night is happening tonight um, at the Campanile, if you want to go. It's my plug, shamelessly. Um, but I think that there are different ways of having these conversations that might, um, like they, they could be innovative, right? And um, people can bring new ideas to the to these types of conversations. I appreciate Cece you naming the investments, right? And investments are much broader than financial investments and really speak to the larger commitment. That really does uh, bring us to our next question for our panelists, which is, how can our campus community critically engage with mod various models and understandings of safety as harm and violence continues to be perpetuated both on and off campus? So Tobiris, I would love if you're able to speak to that question. Yeah, absolutely. Ooh, I had to take a deep breath on that one. Um, how do we critically engage with these models? Um, 
So in 2003, I was um, faced with an opportunity to um, work with a group in Durham, North Carolina, uh, that was called the Change Program. And this group um, was a group of facilitators that did a psychoeducational um, six month groups for um, largely men, but we also expanded um, beyond the male gender folks who have taken some responsibility for being violent in their home and their relationship. And when I started that work, first of all, I was like, well, things like this exist. This, uh, you know, I had never heard of, of such, such uh, programs. And as I've continued to do similar work for the last 20 years, one thing I have become really intimately aware of is that violence is such a, a reality and a possibility always within our species. And I, I had to really come into contact with that early on so that I didn't create a dynamic of us versus them, me as the great teacher of these people who you know did bad things because I could never do that. I had to become really aware of the reality that all of us are a few decisions away or with intention or, or without intention from harming somebody that we care about or that we don't know. When we step to this uh, concept with that level of awareness and, and even humility, we're able to really talk about what can it mean to change the nature of how we respond when violence happens? How do we help educate each other and learn the environments and the spaces and places we're coming from and some of the norms that existed where we're coming from that once we arrive here, we realize, oh, those are not in line with the principles that are stated. Those are not in line with what I hear in GVO. Those are not in line with what I hear in orientation. And so for me, it really starts with that place of, um, and, and I want to, I want to speak as a as a leader on this campus. I want to talk to those in leader who are leaders in power first. When we understand that violence is happening around us, that harm, and that the definition and the the gravity of a harm can only be determined by the person who experienced it. When we start to really understand that, when we understand not only the interpersonal harm but the institutional and the systemic harms, we as leaders must take account for our part in that. We must become complicit in transformation and not complicit in the regeneration of harm. We must question the policies and the daily practices, and there are many of them. When you commit to that critical consciousness, you will not be able to go through a day of work on this campus without saying many opportunities to really shift and make this a better place for a greater number of people. But it really takes us looking, you know, and, I, and as I've become a manager four years ago, I could see the easy pathways to not be a conscientious manager, to not be a caring and a, and a loving and a service leadership focused manager. Um, but in community with uh, other like-minded people, we have found our ways to challenge and push back against certain policies that exacerbate harm and to understand from other communities, from our teams on this campus, from our students, what we might do to, to make this campus um, the aspirational place that, that we want it to be. Uh, because those there's so many pockets where that does happen. And so, you know, I think I'm just calling to leadership, those of us who are leaders, there's a particular charge we must have. If you look around at your teams, particularly looking at the the queer, trans, the BIPOC folks on your teams and, and tune into the extra additional work they often, we often have to do to show up for the mission of this university. Then you will start to understand, hmm, how do I in my leadership disrupt the daily grind? How do I make sure that as a leader, I'm centering the wellness of the folks that I lead? How do I make sure I'm listening closely and deeply to the students that are telling me what's not working for them in our programs? And so I think there's so much deep listening that has to happen when we critically engage. Critical engagement asks us to approach the conversation with cultural humility, centered and grounded in what we might know, but also realizing there's so many things that we don't. And in conversation, we are able to highlight the things that we don't know, we don't know. And that's where the real harm can happen too, you know, when we're acting in absolute ignorance and in that way. And so 
So that's what I would say. This, this charge is to the leaders on this campus to be really good listeners, to really engage in transformative complicity. And when you're holding up something that relates to this system that has to be a hard line, be transparent about it. You know, at the end of the day, I always think about this campus and I think about the beautiful things about this campus. And I also say, look at this business, this educational business operating as educational businesses too, right? Because we can't ignore and not speak to the things that are the barriers to these very things that we're talking about. To do so leads us to a state of insanity because we're like, what am I working for and not getting anywhere? So as leaders, if there are if there are roadblocks to the things that we profess to be doing, let's speak those clearly. Let's take account to those. And before I became a manager, you know, I was very involved in labor activism and uh, and still carry those values even as a manager, which you can do. <laughs> um, and it really taught me how all of these things to work together and how we all rely so much on each other. And it is imperative that we just speak truth in these situations because we can pivot and make different uh, decisions and we can engage differently when we really can speak to the, the barriers, when we can say that is not the financial objective right now. You know, this is what I'm hearing from here, from this, this um, level of power. We have to speak truth in those situations. Um, and I think that's when we can really begin to engage critically as we know that things and violence and harm is still happening around us. From Paris, I felt like I, I just went to church. <laughs> I really appreciate even thinking about that question. And as we even think about what is critical engagement, um, I think that's really important. And as you really shared how humility plays such a significant role um, in how we operate, um, I just really appreciate that. Um, Lucy, you know, I would love to hear your input as well in terms of this conversation around um, really this critical engagement with our campus around this conversation. Thank you. Um, when I engage with this question and might hope to offer to this group is to think about campus not as a bubble, but as continuous with our backyards, our neighborhoods, the broader Bay Area. Um, I think there's often an idea that we put up sort of metaphorical walls around campus and that our ideas about safety are about protecting those who are within those walls. Some of the walls a little bit literal, some of them a little more metaphorical and often quite policed. We sort of have a, um, an apparatus, if I'll name it in my own language here, of border control around campus. Um, and that even though ostensibly the grounds are public or at least quasi-public, many people I think don't experience campus like that. And so I hope that we can bring um, sort of a critical um, lens toward who is safe and where. Um, I also think that one of the challenges is often balancing what we might hope for short-term change, you know, maybe the immediate cessation of certain kinds of harm. I think about um, a lot of the sort of property crimes and harms, understanding those things are often overlapping, but not necessarily identical terms that are so um, activating for our campus community and recognizing that those are often messaged and they often are deeply impactful for the people who are at the center of them and deserve attention and dominate the short-term narrative at the expense of the bigger, longer-term project of building deep safety for all. Um, I don't have the answer as to how to engage those sort of different horizons, the thing to do now, the thing to build toward in the future, but want it to always be front of mind. Um, and when we think about sort of the the reflex the reflexiveness towards short short term thinking and the ways that we um, police the boundaries of campus and whose safety um, gets centered, whose well being is acknowledged as important, um, the thing that I often have to remind myself is that the work is not the displacement of harm, but the cessation of harm, and that often when we bring a surveilling and criminalizing apparatus to questions of safety, all we are doing is displacing harm. And our way of addressing harm and violence right now is often putting people in cages or saddling them with such um, debt and records in the eyes of the state that their lives become really small and impossible. And both of those things are experiences of trauma that perpetuate cycles of violence. And 
Um, I'm really interested in attending to the root causes of harm and understand violence, as Tobira said, always be possible, but not inevitable. And that is an expression of unmet need. And so when that is coming up in our campus community, no matter who is causing harm, it's an expression of unmet need. And what if we were to try to meet that need? Bringing in what Cece said about not all the needs are the same and that we can't talk about this work sort of in a monolithic sense. Um, and so that's challenging because many folks, particularly the student body who come through campus are here in a very short-term sense that our experiences here are three, four, five, six years long typically. Um, and building some of the institutional memory and commitment to that long-term project can be challenging. Um, but it's another important part of sort of the critical thinking around this that always challenges me. I don't profess to have any answers, but think that together we can probably engage. Thank you, Lizzie. Passing the mic to Cece for your input on this question. I mean, I don't know. I don't know the answers. Um, and not that you're asking for that. Um, but it's really resonating with this idea of like mm -hmm. listening. Um, and like, how, how do we do that? You know, like, how do we um, sort of like how we do do that at different levels, like whether I'm listening to the person sitting next to me, or if as a leader, like, how am I listening to, you know, students mm -hmm. or colleagues um, who are, you know, sharing things that are happening or how they're experiencing the world um it seems so simple but yet it seems so complicated <laughs> as well right it's like am i really listening or am i just looking for what it is like the quick and the, the quick um the short term sort of like to what um lucy was sharing around like short term kinds of solutions or quick solutions, mm -hmm. but how are we sort of trying to transform the campus um, in a more long-term way? Um, and I guess by the nature of the campus, mm -hmm. right? You know, people are coming in, mm -hmm. they're leaving, they're graduating, which is just the, the nature of it. And so I don't know if I have the, the, um, the answers, but I'm thinking about the listening part. I'm also thinking about, um, how we can empower sort of individuals in our community to also take up that I'm leadership broadly speaking, right? Even if it's if I'm just taking leadership in my own, right, in my own safety, mm -hmm. and maybe like sharing that with another person or persons, or maybe my um, supervisor, you know, how do I give, you know, feedback, mm -hmm. right, to my supervisors or my colleagues like that's kind of like a smaller kind of like ecosystem but there still needs to be that safety there if i'm gonna if i spend however many hours of my day at work right um so i don't know if i yeah again i don't know if i have the answer but i'm thinking about that absolutely and i think that is why this conversation is important is that as Lucy mentioned earlier, right, experimentation is really important as we think about the myriad of solutions, models, um, interventions, and how we really start to address this broad, broad, and complex topic. And that actually brings us to our last question for our panelists, which is such an important part, which is what role does prevention play as we think about safety and how we are coming to work towards defining um, safety prevention is really significant. So I'll pass the mic to Lucy to start us off. All right. Um, prevention. Some of this is like brass tacks, literal nuts and bolts. It is infrastructure of safety that works. And I mean, infrastructure in, in, in a physical sense and in also sort of a cultural and institutional sense. Um, it's okay to have locks and to recognize who might need access to particular things. Um, it's creating the conditions that enable people to make good decisions around safety and harm, right? Um, I also think that prevention is about 
building really deep community. You know, I've got a, a colleague here, um, John Simon up in the law school who thinks about these questions a lot with me. And he often says, I wish we could bring campus alive at night. That that's often when people are saying, I don't feel safe. I don't feel safe walking home in the dark. Um, and I get that. And the moments in which I might personally feel safe walking around the dark is when there are people around joyfully. Um, you know, the library is full and campus is well lit and people are conversing as they walk around and that it doesn't feel like this ghost town. And so some of it is about the physical infrastructure of community um, and the fact that, you know, we take care of us um, and that community is probably the number one tool of prevention. I also think about the fact that um, there are groups of folks on campus who have been taking care of each other in ways that aren't visible to the campus that we could probably learn from. I know that many of my disabled and particularly immunocompromised friends right now um, are not and don't feel safe on campus because of continual concern around COVID transmission. And that for them, were they to get COVID, it might be a literally life-threatening experience. And the work of prevention of harm there is listening to what those needs are and then committing to meeting them um, to the work of um, centering folks who are vulnerable and also brilliant in this work. Um, on the prevention front, uh, I also think about um, anticipating that though our work is the prevention of harm, harm may still happen and that there will need to be things we do for the survivors of harm to ensure that they can heal and continue to be here in the ways that they want to be. Um, and I don't know that we've figured that out. I know that many folks, particularly in university health services and in our sort of cultural centers, you know, two of my colleagues are on the panel representing those entities do incredible work. And I think that there is more work that we can do um, for survivor support and healing and agency and empowerment, um, also as a tool of, of prevention of cycles of harm. Um, and then I think um, holding space for people to be imperfect as prevention as well, that if folks are bottling up their challenges that often can sort of produce harm. And that if we had ways to um, give people the space to be messy, we might be able to prevent a lot of harm from happening. And I don't know how to do that. Um, I often wonder about the rhetoric of excellence that Berkeley brings to the table a lot. Um, and that we have this way of excellence constraining the way we can show up for each other. Um, that excellence means infallibility in ways that I think are quite harmful and that then propagate harm outward. Um, and I've got plenty more thinking to do there as well. So I don't know that any of that were co was coherent, but I hope that something I said makes sense as I was riffing. Lucy, your riffs are incredible. I feel like that deep, deeply resonates this idea of excellence, perfectionism, number one, um, a lot to be said there. So thank you for those uh, reflections. And before we shift gears to our Q&A, we actually really want to um, invite you all to ask our amazing panelists questions um, that have come up throughout today's conversation. I just wanted to see Tobira's um, invitation to think about any reflections about prevention. Yeah, thank you so much for what you shared, Lucy. This is, you know, I, I'm in the world, so deeply in the world of intervention, you know, and um, but I want to highlight Kathy Kodama over at UHS, who continues to drop nuggets for me on what prevention actually means and how we can look at mental health more through that lens. You know, and so, you know, I just have a couple thoughts. One is, what is the original goal? What is it that we're trying to create here? And when we really get clear on that, then we can get clearer on what are the things that would stand in the way of that. Um, and so for me, whenever I hear prevention come come up, I, it, it leads me to want to really drill down into, first of all, do we have the same understanding of what we're trying to prevent, <laughs> you know? Um, and do we understand, can we get in the same minivan and ride together as somebody getting off at an exit here? And it's like, well, that's no longer prevention. And so, you know, I think there's a lot we can learn together, but really making sure that we're, we're clear on and what environment we believe um, is necessary and is desired. Um, and understanding the mind, body, spirit, and environmental barriers that really impact our ability to exist that way. 
you know, thinking again about plants, you know, if I want a plant to grow, it's going to start with the soil. It's going to start with everything around that seed, supporting it in the way it needs. And so um, prevention would be looking at what, you know, what about the water? What kind of water quality does it need? How does, what does the acidity of the soil, what does the amount, amount of, the right amount of sunlight, when are its dormant periods? When I really start to understand that, then I can get ahead of it and really start to, to, uh, better dive into understandings of prevention. So I'll leave it there. Thank you, Tobias. I love how your analogy were in a minivan. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> Next up, um, well, that concludes the questions that we had prepared for all of our panelists. So now we'll be shifting gears for the Q&A portion of the conversation today. Um, so Antman, let me know if we're good to go. I believe we have one question queued up at anything. Okay, beautiful. Um, so this question, um, I think really touches upon, um, really we're thinking about kind of the day-to-day the -day lived experience of our campus community members. So this question, um, campus is not only a place where people work and learn, but is also a place where people uh, live. What does it mean to be safe where we live? How can we build safety in our literal homes? And so I wanna open up to our panelists if anyone wants to um, start to answer that question. Um, I, I can start it and then you know, pass it off to my other panelists. Uh, so this question brings up for me at, and the social services, our unit is um, the unit at the Tang Center that uh, has a community social worker. Um, on our team that uh, specifically uh, supports uh, stu uh, parenting students and the University Village community. Um, and over my years of working with these colleagues, I've learned so much about um, what communities are asking for and needing and where those um, requests seem to get stuck and fall or seem to be run around. And so I would say it starts with the community you know, I'm never outside of a community going to be able to tell the community what is best for them and what they need to feel safe and to feel cared for. Um, but I think so many times communities are saying the same thing year after year and not really being heard and not being given any reason why the requests are falling flat. And so I think in to this question, I would elevate true accountability to what it is we say we're supposed to be doing for communities, housing communities on this campus. And this extends to, you know, res halls, this extends to co-ops that we partner with, this extends to um, um, Greek homes that we partner with. Like, what does it really mean? And what do those communities have to tell us? They are the ones living there day to day, navigating in and out of these communities. And so in my mind, that's where you start. And once you are there, commit to really heeding the word of communities and to really being transparent when there are systemic barriers and then working together with how do we topple those barriers to move forward because we can do nothing if a community is telling us they need something and again and again and again and again and generation after generation nothing happens so start with the community and start being committed to listening to the community and acting in step with what community tells us they need. Thank you, Tobias. Lucy, did you wanna? Yeah, I mean, I have one quick thought here, which is um, I don't think we have on campus enough um, programming, for lack of a better term, set up to know whether we're moving in the right direction. Um, the primary mechanism we have for tracking improvements in safety are crime statistics that are governed in their collection by the federal government. Um, and that is a piece of the puzzle, but it's not the full puzzle. And I think what's missing right now is our, our ways in the plural to capture these types of conversations about what is safety and how do we know when we're safe and build programs of monitoring around them that are not surveillance oriented, that are somehow um, generated by community for community, 
but that help us to identify whether what we're trying, some of the experiments we're talking about running, whether that's the forthcoming mobile crisis response team out of university health services, or some of our work to build curriculum for student workers who have roles that relate to safety on campus, these sorts of things, um, whether they're moving us in the right direction. I don't think we know. I think there's a lot of um, sort of activation in public narratives around crime and safety right now that are not necessarily grounded um, in the evidence available to us in a comprehensive and full way and are often motivated by um, the entities that have a stake in carcerality and in viral media. And I think it would be helpful to divorce ourselves as a campus from that, to build a program of safety monitoring, evaluation, experimentation, adaptive feedback and management that build safety on campus in a way that we have defined it. And that includes crime. I don't wanna dismiss um, folks who've been impacted by crime. I really do think that matters. And I think that um, we need to work on the prevention front and the survivor support so that people are made whole in a variety of ways. Um, but I don't think we know yet if we're moving in the right direction, if what we're trying is working or if we need to try different things. Um, and that will require resourcing. You know, that's I'm almost sort of a PhD student here scoping a PhD dissertation research project when I'm on my way out. Um, but I think that that's a missing part of the puzzle. And that relates to sort of how people feel safe at home. Like when people are living in UVA and res halls and Greek life and co-ops and near campus apartments, are we tracking how safety is happening there or not? And how do we know if we're making things better? Okay, I wanna move us, I know we have a few more questions. Um, so for our next one, how can we return to safety after trauma, specifically in the workplace? How do we trust offers or invitations to be ourselves when we're experiencing harm in previous work environments? That's a big one. So if anyone want to invite you all to think about that, um, and if anyone wants to answer that question. I know I just spoke, but as folks are taking a moment to collect themselves, my quick thought is um, some of this question relates to what a person might believe the institution to be. Like, I think it's many things. It's people. It's the relationships we have with each other. It is our collection of norms and practices as a group of folks doing work. It is the policies and the laws that govern what we do. It is the education as business question that Tobias brought up earlier. And so I, I often sit with a lack of resolution about what I ask for the institution to give me. Um, I relate to the institution as a worker. The UC is my boss and it will never love me back. And the people in my life with whom I work do love me in this um, whole sense investing in who I am and could be as a person. And so, you know, to think about that question, I don't know that I would ask for healing or wholeness from the UC, but I wonder what it looks like to ask for that from one's colleagues. And it'd be interesting to hear Tobira speak about this. You said you can still be an organizer as a manager, and I believe you because you're brilliant and I want to know more um, because some of this question, I think, relates to the people who have decision-making power over any one of our work environments. Um, but I'm often challenged by what the UC is in answering some of these questions about how to be whole at work. I don't always know what's possible there, I think is sort of the moral of this little story. Yeah, do you have some CC comfort? Oh, go ahead, Tobias. You know, I take a deep, I, I, I breathe with this one because I, I really I'm resonating with what you're saying, Lucy. Um, like, where are we looking for this sense of safety to come from, um, and how do we co-create it with with the folks around us? And there are different um, things that get activated. Thinking through my director and management lens, you know, when I'm hearing about harms or um, and whether they happen at work or outside of work, and I'm also thinking about right now of many of the harms related to racial identity and queer identity and gender identity um, that folks experience not only outside of work but at 
work because we carry ourselves in all of these spaces, of course. And so a return to safety in these situations after an experience of trauma is one about understanding, and I'm kind of going through the mental health lens because this is what our unit at social services does, is understanding what a person's initial baseline was. So if a person initially doesn't feel super safe at work when they start, doesn't feel included, doesn't feel like their voices are valued, and then something else, an incident on top of that happens, then that person really was never in a baseline place of safety. So now they're even more impacted by the environment. And so it leads us all to question, you know, how do we co-create in small moments and small conversations and in larger conversations? Um, a sense of safety and a sense that we can heal from the experiences we've had. And knowing that that path towards healing will look different for every person. And, you know, I was speaking about listening earlier and I saw a, a comment in the um, in the questions, you know, and I, and I think it's easy to, it's easy to discount these, you know, even the concept of listening because we just think about it as just hearing something and then like, okay, well, I've heard it. But what I'm talking about is, is an active commitment to one, hearing, two, understanding, and three, really putting into practice what it is I'm understanding in that situation. And when we take that perspective to listening, I think we really can move forward. And that also relates to healing from a trauma that we've experienced. The university makes certain claims about the workplace that we're supposed to be able to enjoy. And so if that, work, if that workplace does not live up to that, then not only do we need the university to be accountable, we also need our own, the smaller, again, about scale, we also need to break it down to our, our department. We also need to break it down to our team, our unit, and then in our relationship with other people. That is such a personal journey in healing and understanding trauma that no answer any of us are gonna give is gonna perfectly get at this because it is, it is a long journey to healing when you experience trauma. There are moments where you might be able to forget it. There are moments where it's all you might think about, you know? And so I just want to highlight that, that none of us can give an answer that's going to perfectly suit that because we're not speaking to individual situations. But that's where I think really tuning in to, and my, one of my teachers calls it the, the fine ear and the fine eye. What is being said? What is not being said? What are my own projections on what I'm hearing, right? And how do I understand the systemic, the interpersonal, the institutional, like the four eyes of oppression, if y'all have ever heard of that, the internalized things that I continue to exacerbate inside myself that can cause trauma. When we are really committed to working on that, to continue to evolve in that, then I think we can hear each other and offer pathways. Some people will take more administrative pathways you know, to go down a healing journey. Some will not want that, you know, and I think it's having a menu of options that people can access when they've experienced something that they feel is a trauma. Um, and really big thing we have to acknowledge is when things are sanctioned by the university that people experience as a trauma. Whoa, what do we do then? Because based on policy, this is the right thing, but based on personal experience, it is not. So this is one we can talk about forever, but those are a few things that, that, comes in, that come to mind. Thank you for that wisdom, Tobias. I wanna make space for CC as well as we begin to start to wrap up our Q&A. Yeah, I, so much that's coming up for me, it's like, we need to have this conversation more. Um, like I was thinking earlier about sort of like the workplace question, and you know how do we kind of move forward after that but it, there's a piece around the trust that that is broken essentially um that would need some rebuilding i think and i feel like there's also like a a consensualness <laughs> in that like you know are we gonna like work together to rebuild this and you know that kind of thing and I feel or I've seen in sometimes that sometimes the infrastructure that's been created by the university doesn't allow for that. So that's one piece that's coming to mind around like 
returning to work, it, like in the workplace kind of thing. Um, and then I'm also sort of thinking about the co-creation, like that's such a cool concept around like, how do we rebuild this together? Um, and it goes back to my, my comments earlier around like scale and you know, that kind of thing. But I think we can all make a difference at least within our like circles, right? And hopefully like everyone's doing that and then the, like, it multiplies. Um, that's the optimist in me. Um, but I still think that there's still additional investment that, that needs to be done. Investment in prevention or investment in, in centers and that kind of thing. Because when we think, when the fact that, um, you know, Gen X gets funding from a referendum you know what I mean? Like that has expanded like our services and that kind of thing. But that's like additional like taxing that we're doing to students, right? So that doesn't feel good either, right? So how are we really thinking about reinvesting in um, and looking at the systems that exist on our campus? That's kind of broad, but I'll, I'll just close my comments there. Yeah, absolutely. Planted a lot of seeds, you see, for thought and, you know, additional um, reflection. And, you know, at this juncture, um, we have other questions, but want to wrap up. Um, I really want to thank each and every one of our panelists. Really, the amount of wisdom and brilliance in this conversation um, really provides me just with so much, I think, affirmation that we are really aligned in terms of thinking about um, the, these really big priorities and having this conversation today has been really, really wonderful in terms of all of your perspectives and insights. So I just wanna thank all of you so much for this important conversation.